Morning, everybody. So Jake and I are going to do a bit of a double act here uh, to give you an overview to the work of our group, the Health Systems Collaborative. Um, we're a multidisciplinary applied team, uh, and we're going to introduce you to the staff that are based here in Oxford. But importantly, as with many of the other groups, we have colleagues and collaborators that we're working with based in a range of different LMICs. Uh, and together with them, as our name would suggest, we're interested in better understanding and strengthening health systems but also in strengthening capacity building for us all and much more widely in the kinds of research that we do. So um, this slide just illustrates the Oxford-based staff that are here in HSC. Uh, and as you can see by the list on the right, we bring together a range of different types of expertise and experience and backgrounds uh, in clinical uh, practice and studies and in different types of social sciences. Um, we have backgrounds in human geography and anthropology and development studies, uh, in economics, in health systems more generally, global health. Uh, and the research team uh, are really privileged to have the support uh, in management and admin of Holly and Francis, who are fantastic uh, members of our team. And really importantly, as part of the team, we have a large and brilliant uh, group of DPhils who come from many different parts of the world and are working with us all. Uh, we work with a larger set of DPhils, but these are all DPhils whose supervision is led through the HSC. There are many different ways of categorizing and grouping the type of research that we're already funded to do, but, and this is just one way. Um, but we're interested in and in conducting research currently on diagnostics and technologies, on how these are introduced into health systems, how they're implemented and used, how they're overseen, and less commonly, how they're removed once they're not functioning well from health systems. We're interested in more generally how services are designed and how they might be redesigned to better serve uh, the health workers and also the patients. In terms of those middle two boxes there, we're interested in patient experience, in improving quality of care for vulnerable groups, including but not only young children, their mothers and family members. With human resources for health, we're conducting research aimed at understanding the training, the, um, the performance, the oversight, the well-being um, of health workers uh, and other staff up and down health systems. And we're interested in strengthening this, partly uh, looking in the middle box there, partly as an effort and way of building health system resilience. We're interested in how health systems might be more resilient to the everyday chronic challenges that they face in many low um, resource environments, but also the acute uh, stresses and shocks that uh, health systems have to deal with. So resilience for chronic and acute uh, stresses and climate change as an example are of something that brings both acute and chronic stresses to the health system. Uh, and Jake's going to talk about some large scale new funding he's got uh, on climate change. And across all of our work, we, we are interested in how international research is conducted and how to strengthen equity for all of the players involved in international research uh, and to make sure that the research is conducted uh, as powerfully as possible for those it's most, most suppo supposed to be um, serving. So we weren't sure about how we should um, introduce you and provide an overview for all of this work. But what we thought we'd do is just highlight a few examples very briefly of research that's either currently under review for funding or that's received recently large scale um, funding and is about to begin or has, has recently begun. So I'm gonna start with giving a few examples with the diagnostics and technologies. So Sebastian Fuller has submitted um, two different MRC Applied Global Health grants um, with collaborators. Uh, looking at, one of them is looking at pathways to implementation of diagnostics. And in this particular application, uh, his aim is to introduce and implement point of care tests for STIs in Zambia. Uh, and he's introducing an approach as an exemplar of a transferable approach that could be used for the implementation of different types of di diagnostics in different contexts. 
And the approach, which is um, will be introduced by the research team in collaboration with the WHO uh, and with colleagues in Zambia, it aims at bringing together different stakeholders um, through a series of workshops uh, with specific tools that help to identify, track, implement, and evaluate a set of tasks around the implementation of diagnostics. So this is an example of participatory action research that's multi-method um, in how it's implemented. A different kind of research, which is not action research by the research team itself, but is the research team doing an evaluation of an implementation of a national intervention um, is led by Sebastian with Leonard Batima. And this is around evaluating the implementation of a national telemedicine program in Ghana. And here the research team is looking at evaluating uh, the impact and the process are, of the intervention uh, and with an interest in particular on the focus that they have of improving access to quality primary health care through this intervention. And the team are interested in looking at the implications for providers uh, and the quality of care that's offered in primary health care facilities. So that just gives an illustration of two pieces of work under funding on diagnostic, diagnostics and technologies. And I'm going to give a few examples of research that's um, falling under these three groups of these boxes here now. So one of these, Shobi, uh, a clinical researcher, has submitted and will be interviewed in the next couple of weeks um, for a, a Wellcome Trust Early Career Award. And this is aimed at solving the wicked problem. So a problem of um, many uh, interrelated complex influences on the problem of high mortality amongst small vulnerable newborns in Indonesia. And uh, Shobi is interested in better understanding the problem and then introducing with collaborators in Indonesia, innovative interventions with a focus on shared decision-making and family-centered care. So this is an example of um, introducing, uh, implementing, designing and evaluating uh, complex interventions in health systems. So, so far I've given some examples of research that's under review and that will hopefully be funded. For the rest of the presentation, Jake and I are going to just give you some illustrations of research that's recently um, received funding. Uh, one of these, uh, I'm delighted to say, is an NIHR professorship, uh, and this is work that I've been funded to lead, looking at moral distress amongst frontline research staff. Moral distress is our situations where people know what they ought to do in a situation, but the circumstances don't allow them to, to do what they ought to do. And moral distress um, can have a whole range of symptoms and implications for the people who are experiencing it. And it's something that's gained a lot more attention since COVID-19 in the NHS and UK, but the kind of situations that lead to it are everyday experiences in many LMICs. Uh, and the idea with this grant is to um, work out how this might be minimized, how it might be managed. And this is important because it has implications for individuals, it's bad for science and it's bad for health system delivery as well. So this is work in collaboration with Kenya, but also with the WHO and many other collaborators from different contexts. At the heart of it is an international uh, set of case studies um, which expose frontline staff to different types potentially of moral distress. So I'll be, under, I'll be keen to characterize this and then to look at through these case studies uh, how transferable that learning is across many other LMICs with the overall goal of developing practical guidance for funders, for institution leads uh, and for team managers and research leads. So I hope that gives a flavor of some of the work so far, and I'm gonna hand over to Jake, who's gonna talk about the rest of our work. Cheers, Sassy. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about climate change and healthcare infrastructure first, which is an area that I've been uh, really keen to develop for quite a long time, um, but recently got the opportunity to do it. Um, yeah, this has already been mentioned, you might have, otherwise heard about it too because I've been telling everyone about it but uh yeah this is a, a novel extreme 
we extreme weather risk insurance system for Kenya or new risk as we call it. I don't know if we do prizes for acronyms, but um, I, I want one if that's the case. Uh, and it's led by myself and my colleague, Ben Sofa, in, who's based in Kenya. Our focus is on preparing Kenya's health system, its counties, its communities, and its patients for extreme weather. You've probably seen on any given week um, extreme weather events happening around the world. But of course, when they uh, interact with uh, poorer communities, more vulnerable communities, we get very, very large disasters. Um, North Africa saw one recently, but uh, Kenya gets them quite regularly. Droughts, floods, mudslides. Um, and this work is targeting that area. The funder is uh, an, the NIHR, and it's a collaboration with Kemri Welcome um, and four county governments who really do a lot of the decision making in Kenya and also St. Andrews. Um, they are, yeah, it's also worth saying this is three million pounds over four years beginning in January. Just to tell you a little bit about how we're approaching this, because I think it does in some way speak to some of the work that we do in, in the Health Systems Collaborative. The first layer of this, um, the first layers of this, in fact, are kind of GIS layers. So we have a, a, a climate analysis, which, which we can see spatially, and they've got very accurate lately. They can get down to one kilometer resolution. And that's highly relevant if you want to look at the extreme weather effects that you'll see in each given health facility in Kenya. Now, luckily, previous work of Kemri Welcome shows very accurately where different health facilities are in Kenya. And so we can we can see the climate, um, the, the extreme weather effects that we'll see in each given facility. And then we all also have some data on population and um, which populations are served by which one of these facilities. And we also know how vulnerable they are. So that's pre-existing indexes of, 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 uh, uh, of their vulnerability, their economic ability, their access to education, clean water, all of these things, the social determinants of health, as well as access to healthcare. And then finally, um, we'll, we'll probably adjust a new uh, WHO survey, which is attempting to look at um, uh, how prepared facilities are, but it's the one that they've developed is this kind of internal checklist, but we want to make something up with a bit more rigor in it so we can see how, how um, affected these facilities will be. And then finally, a lot of the work that we do is oriented towards the users of health systems, towards patients in the communities that, that hospitals serve. And that's very much the case here as well. We want to take all of these different layers and present them back to, to communities and say, what do you want to do about this? Because the truth is, um, there's been a long and very uh, failed history of, uh, of people who look like me coming to bits of Africa and telling them what they ought to do in certain, certain kinds of uh, emergency situations. So instead, we want to go there and say, you know how you had that flood in 2018 and it lasted like 10 days and it was terrible? Well, what if it lasted 20 days? What would you do? How would you prepare? And, and help them to build local plans. Um, this is really important because, uh, yeah, the, the communities have already told us some things that, that, uh, that really changed the shape of this whole project. So I can't um, emphasize our work with communities enough. And then it, finally, the bit that's in the, the, the fancy acronym is, is the risk insurance side. So we want to package this up and see whether or not we can ensure the health system to stay open during periods of extreme weather. Um, this is a bit of a reach. It's almost like a stretch goal in kind of, you know, entrepreneurship terms or something. But the, uh, the, the, the truth is that, well, the fallback is that each one of these components speaks, you know, develops its own useful outputs. Um, and so this, they stack together to allow us to address this larger question about whether or not insurance would work. So that's, that's uh, yeah, that's climate, um, but also just more broadly in health systems resilience and responsiveness, a related and very complementary project is led by Mike, but also with um, collaborators in uh, Makarere and Witz. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a large uh, Welcome Trust Discovery Award. That's 5 million, I think, over four years, four years. Um, and this, this work is uh, broad, but looking at that first, uh, layer of, of, of hospital treatment, which traditionally has been a little bit underrated, a little bit underloved by a lot of global health emphasis. We put a lot of emphasis on primary health care because that's cheaper and it's closer and, you know, the health economists like it. 
but we've perhaps looked past the important role of first line hospitals in both in providing services themselves, which are not available in the primary healthcare setting, but also in supporting that network of, of lower facilities too. Um, we had a meeting recently in Oxford. Uh, this isn't all the health systems collaborative. Uh, there, there's some other people in it, um, but there are a lot. That is a lot of the faces that are in our group, and um, a lot of the people that are involved in this. So it's a really big international col collaboration. It's a very large project, and uh, should keep Mike and lots of others busy for for uh, the foreseeable future. Um, again, just thinking about the way that this has been dealt with so far. Again, this is the map that I mentioned before that Kemi Welcome put together, um, where you can really see facilities around Africa. And it's super useful to be able to, to, to see them spatially that way. But I suppose this, this project is more often looking at those ones that are a little bit further away, a bit le less dense, those little dots that are kind of on their own. And um, in, in that way, um, we, we start to see a whole different set of issues that affect those, uh, those hospitals. And most often in the way that they've been dealt with so far, it's been in terms of the certain levels of de jure uh, services that they should be able to offer. So some people get together in, in Geneva or somewhere similar, and they say, you know, a hospital like this ought to have this, this, and this. Um, but of course, on the ground, that's not necessarily what they have. And they perhaps look past their, 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 the role that they have in providing other services and maintaining health in the region more, more, uh, more broadly. Um, strategic investment is needed in this, and that will be an element of the work that's looked at. Um, but importantly for Mike um, and a lot of the team members, we, we're really focused on HRH, Human Resources for Health. A lot of this work that we would like to do, a lot of the, the, um, the remaining goals in global health, the, the, the stuff that we want to focus on, it's always dependent on people doing it on the ground. And so there's always been a big focus in our group on HRH and in, in, uh, developing that um, for that really came across in in, uh, in our project recently um, and again this is, speaks to the uh, how related these two projects are um, we went to tell them about uh, this this you know this amazing climate science project that we were going to do we pulled together some community members to talk about it we said we're going to fix your local hospital we're going to put solar panels on it we're going to um, provide uh, you know help help provide water for it would that be useful to you and they said no it'd be we don't want you to do that um, they're useless they don't show up for work and um, if you look a little further staff aren't paid you know that they're regularly paid it's really difficult to get to that facility and so imagine we did all that work to make that facility resilient but then it doesn't open because staff don't want to work there and that's something that mike's going to really look at and this group's going to look at um, how do you support care even in these hardship areas? How do you convince young doctors to go to really distant places and work under a tin roof in 45 degree temperatures? Um, not easy, I'm sure. And then next, uh, you're not reading this wrong. We are now doing some work in the NHS, thanks to Atacrit. Um, So this is uh, exciting new work. Uh, something else that, you know, it's been a recurrent theme in, in our group is around uh, task shifting. And uh, I, I, I'm... I'm don't know if you all know about the role of physician associates in the UK, but they're um, like the uh, uh, other roles that have preceded them in task shifting. Um, they've been introduced somewhat quietly and then grown rapidly, and that looks to be happening to physician associates. So a thousand new um, physician associates graduating every year, and they're working in NHS hospitals, sometimes much more in some areas than in others, as far as I understand. Um, but little is known about their roles and uh, the scope of their work. So this exciting new work um, will be led by Atacrit in um, both in, in Kenya and in the UK. Um, this is quite practical work. There's uh, some outputs for this that should really help uh, you know, people on the ground, and it should lead to better data systems and tools, which will you know, allocate and plan for these PAs much more effectively. Um, it should help with recruitment, retention, and role satisfaction. This is a real problem. Like, do they become junior doctors at some stage once they're really experienced? What's the top end of a PA look like? Um, what, what does their future career look like? Um, so just stepping into that problem, but then also trying to develop some short videos to, to explain this and share it and sharing um, learning uh, uh, across, across the different trusts that we worked with in this project. 
Final one from our group is Shobi. I don't know if she's online. Shobi, are you here somewhere? No, good. Um, I can be really kind to her then. Um, she, save her, her blushes. But Shobi's amazing. Shobi did, you know, pediatric surgery and uh, worked in various places around the world. Um, she's she's really passionate about child health, and uh, I think from her perspective, so many of the things that she was dealing with were were avoidable. Or by the time that she saw them in the clinic, that they were uh, problems that were manifested much earlier in, in kids' lives. And so she became interested in diet um, and general health and welfare of children. And this led her to do some work, which was quite, you know, it wasn't like there was a big call for loads of money in this. She just did it. Um, so she's got my eternal respect for that. And uh, yeah, she's been looking at food poverty in Oxford, which is a shameful phrase. Um, there's even a worse one. There's malnutrition in Oxford, which we can talk about too. But yeah, she does this amazing work in pulling together a whole network of frontline food bank workers and uh, support people who work around schools, people who volunteer their time and weren't, you know, had put themselves down to part-time work so that they could run food banks and do other things in the communities that they work from. She invited them all to, to Green Templeton and, and kind of united them and has since then been to the you know Houses of Parliament and pushed this at very, very senior levels and has had all kinds of impressive um, effects as a result of this. So yeah, a little uh, props to Shobi. Um, that's it for now. Uh, we're, we're a broad group. This isn't really covering a lot of the, th the areas that we we have been working in, for example, doing a, um, a, a work in Vietnam around intensive care that's closing now, but um, has been super interesting. A lot of work in supporting different technologies, different ideas for, for hospitals and health systems. And that implementation science method is um, something which is uh, pretty common across our group. And so if you've got new technologies or uh, new systems or new kind of clinical ideas that you'd want to bring into practice, it might be worth um, giving us uh, giving us an email and, and connecting, so we'd happily talk through your project and your ideas.